introduced um, by the BAM Center, for example, James Prophet's Project Cells, which was a very exciting early scientific visualization collaboration with um, a geneticist and a, a cancer researcher, mathematician, uh, and of course, Jane played the role of both artist and design. Interactive screen was a very important part of the BAM Center. It was an opportunity to, um, to kind of bring together uh, artists and designers and uh, companies that were emerging in the interactive and digital media space and try and use creativity to influence the kinds of products and projects that uh, would um, come to play with their world. There was a, a sort of notion, of course, um, I'm just going to show these slides, but um, we also were very active at the Banff Media Institute, engaging television directors, producers, and broadcasters, creating awareness about the digital revolution, and supporting independent uh, television through workshops, work studies, and productions. But um, one of the remarkable qualities of that interaction was the kind of denial in many ways uh, within the broadcast industry and distribution industry um, of the kind of um, disintermediation that would um, occur through the impacts of um, interactive media, new media, digital media, and an entire shift in the marketplace. You may recognize some of these, these names. And then uh, hand in hand with um, the uh, work that we were doing through summits and work studies, was a very um, active co-production process, which allowed artists, designers, um, media researchers to access the technology that was very much part of uh, the capacity of the band center, especially uh, after 2000, 2001. Just some slides for co-production. Tapio, Michaela, and David Rokeby's remarkable um, uh, saunas network saunas where you could sit in the sauna um, in um, Helsinki and the sauna at the BAM Center and communicate um, with others in that sauna, seeing their bodies through a kind of blur uh, that um, uh, David kindly placed so you couldn't have explicit details, but hearing them perfectly and then diving into the pool uh, at the BAM Center and um, the sounds of people swimming would reverberate um, through the saunas in both Helsinki uh, and Banff. So those are the kinds of co-productions that we were uh, we were undertaking at Banff. Um, very important component of the Banff Center, which I'll talk about in a moment, was its um, passionate commitment to Aboriginal arts and um, providing a platform for a lot of the very early work that was done by uh, Indigenous artists and um, producers um, and technology researchers in the space of new media. So um, it's Pasu, Ayapish Pasu, speaking the language of spiders, was a very um, important project that was um, begun by Ahasu Ispan Isku, who um, began um, a project with indigenous people who had spent time on the streets, and it was a uh, cyclical story that told about seven generations and how they would bring a future to indigenous experience in amazingly interactive uh, new media work. Lawrence Paul Pilopton in Heron Rights, Indigen White Rights, um, one of the first artistic virtual reality projects ever produced um, and created by the BAM Center uh, in collaboration with uh, Bioapparatus beginning in 1989, completed in 1993, using a very kind of simple IBM platform, but experiencing uh, and exploring the capacity of um, uh, indigenous concepts of uh, graphics and the longhouse and appropriate access to um, the gods um, and the, the creatures within the cosmology of indigenous knowledge. So, of course, the Banff Media Institute had a very strong commitment to research and um, created um, a series of technical facilities, which were known as the Advanced Research Technologies, or ART labs, uh, that were sustained, uh, sustained ongoing research at the Banff Media Institute through the hosting of artists and researchers' residencies. So there was a cave with related visualization and virtual reality software, um, a collaboration 
territory with all manner of um, networked uh, capacity and the ability to work um, with researchers and artists in many different locations, uh, kind of experimental space to look at um, shoot performances and other ways to think about collaboration. And then quite a sophisticated mobile engineering and physical computing lab that had a focus on wearable technologies. And I think part of what was so important about the kind of research that artists undertook was the ability to raise important ethical concerns and critique technology as well as use technology to insist on a kind of diverse or relativist approach to the use and even the design of technology. And uh, to do this in the face of engineering, cognitive science, and artificial intelligence, which drive still to this day, drive towards universal universality. So the kind of pragmatic role of artists in pursuing new applications that are inclusive has been, um, I think, a very significant importance. And the BAMP Center, to its credit, uh, was a kind of leader in that space. So did the lab succeed at BAMP? Um, and I think this is one of those questions uh, that always has to be asked. I mean, BAMP was an independent center. It wasn't a university. And it was very successful uh, when there were significant partners and projects. So Interval Research uh, in California, Paul Allen's shop, uh, which provided uh, tremendous support for the Art and Virtual Environments Project, funding for that project from Heritage Canada, uh, software from Soft Image um, and Ilias Wayfront that enabled that research to happen. When there were visiting researchers, so Dr. Maria Lanton, who uh, ran the, um, the art labs, uh, was particularly talented at bringing in researchers who could undertake projects for shorter periods of time to build a prototype and visualization in VR and audio um, with uh, a very focused and disciplined approach to using the lab. When there was funding to refresh the technology, where of course there was a dependency on research council uh, or provincial funding authorities, and uh, when there was funding to support in-house research. So that was true for a number of us who were located at the Bank Center and able to bring in consistent research grants. But I think one of the challenges um, in building a lab environment at a place like Banff is that when the funding didn't exist and um, when there wasn't a way of consistently supporting research, which tended to need significant uh, both capital and um, operating support, then the labs would, would lie fallow, and they lie fallow to this day. So some lessons there. This is the opening of the, the grand labs, this uh, visualization cave, sort of fun to see people with goggles on um, in 2003, when of course we're in the era of um, both uh, Facebook and Google's move into uh, various kinds of goggle technology. So an unencumbered environment, and these are just some images from the Art and Virtual Environment Program, which was a groundbreaking program in bringing artists and computer scientists together to create various kinds of experimental um, virtual reality world. And uh, a very important moment in Canada's history when Heritage Canada stepped in to create the New Media Research Networks, which uh, explicitly stood in for the failure of National Centers of Excellence program to support creative research. There were two attempts to um, build an NCE. Um, eventually, um, in uh, 2008, the Grand National Center of Excellence was funded, but uh, before that time, it was uh, a kind of desert of funding for significant research in art and technology or sci art. And then, of course, Canary, um, for a period of time, funded creative research if there was a technology component to it. So just some examples of um, projects that were a result of having uh, two or three years of extensive support, significant support from federal uh, programs, the Heritage Program and uh, industry partners, including Nokia um, and uh, uh, Hewlett Packard Lab, uh, Mobile Digital Commons Network, uh, exploring the nature of uh, mobile experiences that were driven by, by sensors, um, so outdoor experiences for the most part using uh, GPS, uh, GIS tracking and sensors. And remember, this is before smartphones, um, so feature phones. So a lot of fun uh, exploring and a lot of um, really amazing capacity in terms of narrative and experience design. A lot of work with body storming methods 
to imagine navigation um, using mobile phone experiences and of course working in the um, amazing environment of Banff. Um, this is a project in a cemetery in Montreal um, and uh, a story that was driven through little pieces of narrative as you went through um, the Banff Park and would be able to play games at various locations and the haunting, which was uh, in um, uh, by the cemetery on Charles Mountain. Um, technologies that spinned off from that um, experimental period of time, such as the Mi Engine, which was um, an open source uh, mobile experience design authoring system, and um, a number of ways of um, using intelligent systems and wearable technology, uh, including very early work with soft circuits, sensors, embedded media, media and uh, even experiments with very early nanotech within that project. Um, uh, Am I Able, which was the second funded project, which had a large group of people uh, working on it at SF Simon Fraser University, again, Concordia uh, and Banff, and was really um, exploring ways that um, wearable technologies would be able to um, help with communication, new forms of communication with um, sports experiences, even health and wellness experiences. Uh, remember at one point we were trying to um, develop a cessation smoking system using very fashionable watches, prodded you every time you wanted a cigarette or went for a cigarette uh, with the University of Alberta. And uh, beautiful work in uh, um, performance and uh, the use of wearable technology. So um, research that still has Sort of valence to this to this day as we look at um, the incredible growth of wearable technologies. Um, Banff was very involved with all kinds of international activities, both creating offsite events and collaborations, including um, a very significant workshop as part of the Dakar Biennale of Contemporary African Art that brought Indigenous new media artists and um, uh, curators and artists of African descent from Canada. Uh, and embedded them within the Descartes Biennale of Contemporary Art to make new work, lead workshops, and create prototypes. And uh, a pretty consistent a relationship with galleries um, at um, the Bank Center to exhibit and exhibit critically um, ideas about uh, new media, new media art. I mentioned the important engagement that Banff had um, with Aboriginal arts at the Banff Center and um, its drive to support Indigenous efforts um, in new, new media and emerging media, and also a very kind of passionate relationship with cultural diversity um, and with gender equity within these emerging fields where often there were very few women in the room as technologies were being signed and invented, bringing um, colleagues from Africa um, and many other places. So um, I'm going to finish very briefly in terms of um, the ban for new media um, institute and, and what it represents, and then move on. But um, Banff, um, we put together a phenomenal archive um, at the Banff Center that um, was online until recently, and it was taken down about a year and a half ago. And um, we have been encouraging the Banff Center to state that archive is um, a phenomenal resource for uh, both this generation and future researchers. So it has audio recordings, commissioned reports. Um, great documentation of the Banff New Media Institute's activities. Um, and of course, from the book that um, Sarah Cook and I um, created, which is still available and available online. Um, but what I wanted to do very briefly was just talk about the themes in that book, which really were an opportunity for us to look retrospectively at, you know, 10 years of activity, really 15 years of activity by the Banff New Media Institute and the kind of preoccupations there and I think you'll see resonance with what is happening now um, at um, OCAD University in our research lab. So uh, uh, a very deep interest in data. Uh, we talked about data as being material, investigating it through its materiality, uh, the changes in the nature of data, its organization, its expression through memory, understandings of artificial intelligence, um, and the kind of impact um, of data in the material world. I think we were ahead of our time in understanding that. So looking at both visualization and simulation, data as a material that had its beauty, 
um, and uh, use data across both scientific visualization, and information visualization, through a whole series of uh, summits and then uh, collaborative research networks that emerged in this process. Physics perception and immersion um, was another very important theme um, in the years of the Bathroom Media Institute. So this idea of imaging technologies, the transformation of how we understand visuality and spatial relationships, um, the idea of uh, four and n dimensions, and the kind of physical um, and virtual architectures and the emerging nature of immersive technologies. Completely relevant again as we move into an area of um, era of augmented and virtual reality. And um, I've been one of the people pushing very hard for us not to lose that early history of theoretical work and critical thinking. Um, becoming machines and humans. So how we define the nature of human and uh, human, the, the, mech, the mechanic, the mechanique um, as concentrated. So my kind of biopolitics of Foucault and understanding the changing nature of, of, of the lens and perception uh, and, of course, of the environment and its sustainability uh, through a whole series of engagement with um, the space in between the human uh, and the artificial and, and the natural. And then um, a kind of focus on um, social and individual identities. So a profound interest and in shift in the ways that social and individual identity um, have been expressed in new media. So the kind of alternate cultures in the World Wide Web through streamed audio and video, uh, gaming and producing new, new structures of knowledge as well as play, and a tremendous interest in, in emerging social media. And of, of ways that identities are being um, critiqued and constructed uh, within the internet as a piece of culture money and law, so ways of thinking about new models of money, economic viability and law from licensing to appropriation to open source, um, and really playing an active, activist role in trying to create a new media industry that was sophisticated and um, engaged in um, the kinds of work that artists could do. And finally, production and distribution. So understanding new systems of, um, of distribution, of collaboration, and the ways that these were phenomenally enabled um, through um, kind of distribution of knowledge in the online environment. So um, I will at the end just talk a little bit about where there's convergence between between these two worlds. And now I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, Oakland University and um, some of the ways that I suppose as an institution we're approaching um, the process of discovery. But as many of you probably know, we're a, a big school 4,700 students, um, about 300 graduate students, the majority undergraduate, um, and with a long history of art, design, media, culture, and social theory. Our largest programs are um, in graphic design, illustration, environmental design, industrial design, and drawing and painting. And this is relevant because we're going to talk a bit about the way the labs are organized and uh, you know how they're sort of made meaningful um, through the work that happens um, in the academic program. So Already, you know, a fundamental difference between a university and an independent research center is, uh, you know, a university has um, faculty who are there for extended periods of time. You can build uh, on research practice. You can um, collaborate within your institutions. There is a kind of um, fundamental difference in the sort of stability of um, that kind of environment. This is a residency environment. And then, of course, there's students, and um, they're um, a creative labor force who uh, want to engage with research in order to be able to, you know, move forward in, in their own knowledge, knowledge formation. So uh, I thought I would share this. This is um, our vision as an institution, incredibly important for how we see research as we're moving forward. So this idea, idea about um, the imaginary and imagination being a multiplicity, that diversity is fundamental to defining imagination, that lived experience is fundamental, and that imagination is also something, you know, that's artificial, that's constructed through various kinds of um, agents and intelligences. So our vision is, uh, CAD University challenges you to audaciously and responsibly pursue the questions of our time through the powerful interplay of art, design, the social sciences, 
humanities and the sciences. So this notion uh, that we're no longer an art and design school, uh, you know, we're an institution that engages with this other, these other forms of knowledge, but through um, asking and answering challenging questions, through critique, through scientific, artistic discovery, and then this sort of set of calls to build aware, generous, and joyful communities, a kind of call for diversity, resilience, equity, inclusion, sustainability, respect for indigenous sovereignty and cultures, so a kind of ethics statement, this belief in transformative um, that we have to be as an institution, but as faculty and students, transformative social, economic, environmental, and cultural agents, and that um, the tools for this transformation are materials, data, technology, and ideas um, enabled through or materialized through research, studio practice, learning, and embodied knowledge. So an interesting framing for an institution. Um, and just historically, it's probably important to say that, it, you know, OCA, Ontario College of Art in the 80s, and then OCAD uh, Art Design were uh, really was home was home, sorry, plural, but was home to electronic arts in the 80s, you know, robotics by artists, attractive media, computer music, Mike Snow, White, David McIntosh, Judith Joel, Simone Jones. I mean, it's a very significant um, dive back list of names of former faculty and current and alumni. And uh, this sort of uh, acre culture is still part of the DNA and very much realized through artistic practice in the labs and through curriculum. We also have um, a very passionate commitment to indigenous knowledge and uh, a visual culture tier one research chair, uh, less involved technologies um, other than uh, digital humanities, the methodology, and then a growing interest in life studies and visual arts, so biology, science, ecology, and the body. And um, program associated with that for many years is our integrated media program, which has opened new fields digital painting and expanded animation, um, and very much sort of looking at it from an art practice, the invention of new technologies. And then um, when design became part of uh, the school in a more formal way, design was present really from the early 20th century, but it was acknowledged late in the 20th century. Um, the development of true design thinking, uh, methods, let's look at design thinking and making problem-based and user-focused, uh, the design of technology is using human tech, human perspectives, including a kind of twisting and tweaking of existing technologies. So strong remake culture, reuse culture, with a deep commitment to zero carbon design and sustainability, and um, very recently, capacity in design for health research, biomimicry, kind of digital design, and our new dean of design um, has turned as a design ethnographer of generous design. Um, just some sense of, you know, again, this sort of international uh, capacity for research and engagement, um, and then a view of um, innovation and research, which is really, you know, seeing art and design as central and driving components in their own right of research, but also of all forms of innovation, um, you know, of health, medicine, material science, biology, the digital economy, engineering, and social science. So you saw that in the vision statement. And, you know, we've been very activist as um, Canada's federal government reframes its inclusive innovation strategy to really talk about the role of art and design. So um, the Digital Media Research and Innovation Institute uh, was founded in, in 2008. Um, it, um, again, as I mentioned, uniquely in a university context. Um, in, and so, uh, but it has real similarities, I think, to Hexagram to the SAT, to um, a lot of the activity um, that's happening, um, you know, internationally still with the space. Very important to say that only a component of research at OCADU is digitally, is focused on digital technology. Um, and again, it's characterized by using um, opportunities to fund experimental research and apply, very applied industry focused research. And you'll see this kind of alignment of academic programs in the lab. So a kind of different methodology to how the Banff New Media Institute um, works. So this is the constellation of labs, um, at least sort of in the initial stage, they, they've emerged and, and changed. And there's some new labs that have developed. 
Um, but the big themes that um, I'm seeing that have some congruity with the Banff Community Institute, but also um, other kinds of shifts, um, are a much uh, less utopian view of social media and social sharing in the era of hypermedia, surveillance, post-digital aesthetics, um, you know, glitch culture, um, and uh, the kind of crisis of, uh, you know, the clusterful space of, of social media. Um, again, real continuity with immersion, vision research, the full sensorium, perception and cognition, um, more and more engagement with biotechnology, biomedical technology, biopolitics and bioethics, uh, tremendous focus on urban sustainability, on livability and wellness, and um, uh, focus not only on visualization, but data materiality. And uh, very much data is IoT, wearable technology, and embodied technologies. And this is just a list of, of the labs. I'm not going to run through all of them, but I'm going to talk about some of them and this sort of relationship between, um, you know, our our curriculum. So the Digital Future Program, which is very much about uh, disruptive technologies and thought leadership to both form um, people who will work in industry, but also will be researchers and artists and, and interveners, um, you know, with um, a, a academic program that um, looks at innovation, uh, science, computer science, engineering, and, and design and art, and uh, both highly collaborative and sort of individual approaches to making, and um, with a focus on partnered research and innovation that in many ways kind of comes out of um, that capacity within the digital media um, uh, curricular offerings. So these are, I, I just kind of threw up um, some of the uh, industry partners that we work with and, and sort of the funding sources. And I will talk about that at the end, but um, um, we um, also have a very strong focus on inclusive design. This is one of our, this is our largest, most capable research center that really looks at um, inclusion for people with disabilities, inclusion for people with um, constrained literacies, numeracy, um, much um, looking at uh, social and equity uh, issues in terms of social inclusion. Um, and these folks are a combination of health researchers, um, engineers, computer scientists, um, and designers. And aligned with it is an inclusive design graduate program, uh, which again, um, look very much at um, these questions of both social and technological inclusion. Um, our mobile experience lab, which works a lot with the digital futures uh, graduate programs again, and kind of looking at uh, location, context for application. So real continuity here from the sort of work that was happening in engineering, um, mobile experiences. And some of the most interesting research is, um, you know, in the space of mindfulness technology. So brainwave monitoring applied to areas such as fetal alcohol uh, visualization and working with kids who are survivors of um, uh, fecal, fetal alcohol. <laughs> um, social body lab, which is uh, looking at the expressive and perceptive nature of the human body. So body-based systems related to mobile and wearable technologies and internet of some great examples of research there. Um, and then again, a, a, a strong interface with um, our uh, industrial design program and um, with our digital futures program, the Strategic Innovation Lab, uh, which is really um, where we differentiate in the space of design thinking. This is um, a lab that looks at possible futures, the intersection of human behavior, new technologies, and uh, organizational capacity um, and makes use of data to do that work as well as a whole series of design and kind of future visioning and play tools. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. I had myself five more minutes. I'm sorry. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll keep going. Um, and then our strategic foresight lab you know, working again very closely um, with a program, a graduate program. So, and uh, other areas of interest are gaming, um, 
Oh, not just completely through this. Um, data visualization is one of our areas of, of deep expertise. Um, instead of looking at data analytics and materialization, with partnerships with data holders in areas that are um, relevant, I think, to, um, again, some of the, the themes that I expressed around the future of cities, cultural analytics, health, uh, mon sonification data and materialization, and addressing challenges in big data. So the lack of criticality regarding the nature of data sets and their origins, um, the problem that scientific realism dominates science and engineering, and the kind of expectations of how visualization work the need to produce new aesthetic theories, um, issues of ethics and access and open data and empowerment through um, visualization, and then with that numeracy, and then uh, on a more practical level, pragmatic level, design, interaction, you know, the nature of the interface, tangibility, the materiality of data, and uh, highly dependent on our, on our graphic design curriculum and students, um, which are teaching data learning data analytics and visualization, environmental design in terms of urban analytics, which has moved more and more into, you know, working with data. Um, and again, just some examples of, um, of projects. I'll move the slides quickly. Um, some very interesting work in using MRI um, and uh, various kinds of scan technology to help in healthcare research and to materialize that which is built in virtual space. I'll just quickly go through these slides, and then um, I just I'm, and then finally um, we've really moved into the space of um, health research. So that interest in uh, you know biomedical research with a new program in design for health that's um, very much aligned with uh, both the um, institutional healthcare research environment um, and working um, in everything from. Uh, looking at the future of brain health and aging and how to support those processes to um, interactive uh, experiences using sensor systems and visualization and music to support older people. And But with a much more set of traditional outputs than the Banff Media Institute. So publication, presentation, um, increasing work in policy-focused research and innovation. And then finally, um, an incubation environment much more amplified than the BAP Center was ever capable of, which launches companies and products that are design focused and uh, basically emerge from um, our research lab or other university research labs in Ontario that are partnered with um, our recent graduates and our faculty. So, um, again, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm ending here. So, you know, the structure and support for labs, again, depends a lot on active researchers who are able to find funding, whether it's through the Canada Council, the Canadian Tri-Council System, um, Ontario's research uh, funding mechanisms, um, framework research. So there's always a criteria challenge that I would say is maybe a growing criteria challenge um, as Canada locks down to more of a sort of STEM-focused environment in its um, Tri-Council research. And uh, I would say a lot, a lot more dependency on commercial, institutional, and not-for-profit partnerships um, and research in order to keep that environment alive. Um, and then interesting thinking and uh, work right now on the idea of individual versus collective leadership of the lab infrastructure, where it's been very much individual researchers leading the labs, moving now towards a collective infrastructure. And of course, a kind of an event context very similar to math. So um, that <laughs> that's my presentation. And this is a wond wonderful way to kick it off. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Let's see if uh, we have questions from people in the attendance. Is there any questions? I, I mean, I, I would just say that I think our role is very much, you know, historically and now, uh, for those of us leading these kinds of environments, is to really um, help to promote, you know, new methodologies, even when we're working in an industrial setting, to try and, um, you know, in collaborative research, um, 
to really try and ask questions that would not be asked if an artist or designer was not at the table. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Luc Corchin has a question. Okay. Uh, hello, Sarah, in San Sao Paulo. Uh, Luc in Montreal. Um, how do you see all this um, uh, art as research with technology filtering out in society? We've been in that bubble for um, 20, 30, 40 years sometimes now in these beautiful labs with this uh, like, um, uh, privileged group of people having access to uh, funds and equipment and things like that. And now, you know, we're teaching it in, in universities like you do at OCAD. But um, how do you see that we're impacting on people's life uh, through you know, something outside of our zone of comfort? Uh, and even outside of academia, because you're still in ac academia, uh, do you see us making progress in the art market, for example? Do you see us uh, or what we do uh, impacting on, you know, uh, clothing design, on architecture, on uh, things that people uh, do uh, without any knowledge of all that research behind? So. Um it, it, it's, it's hard to hear because it's an echo, but I think you asked me about, um, you know, how are we making progress with basically moving um, the kind of research that's happening outside of the um, laboratory environment and um, through our partners. Um, so, um, I mean, w one of the things that um, we're pretty proud of um, at the school is that for example, the Visual Analytics Lab, all of the research is partnered. So we only work with actual data sets. So we um, make sure that whatever we do, uh, and, and there's a, a big focus on user engagement and user engagement from the beginning and in um, kind of constant sort of virtual circle of checking in with um, people both who provide data sets and who are users of the potential outcomes and technology. So we've seen a lot of adoption of the um, inventions or solutions coming out of our labs by some of our partners. That's true with um, that lab. Um, the Inclusive Design Research Center, um, I mean, their methodology is much more of an open source methodology. Um, so they, and they, they've got real muscle power around being able to support an open source environment um, so they've actually seen some of the things, really important things that they've developed be adopted even by like Apple, IBM, et cetera, et cetera, as infrastructure that allows, you know, SMEs to lock in and invent technologies coming off of that, that backbone that they've created, um, or, um, you know, users to actually have direct access to the tools that they've created who are disabled and in, in wheelchairs or, uh, you know, hearing or sight impaired. But, you know, in, in the visual analytics lab, we don't have that capacity to support an open source environment. Um, we don't have that, um, that kind of muscle power. So what, what we try and do instead is work with partners who are able to take what we develop and actually really use it themselves. They have the ability to take the prototype and um, adopt it, adapt it into their environment. I hope that helped to answer. And it's not just publication, it's also exhibition and, you know, discourse. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. We have another question. Um, Montreal uh, now is um, in the big trend, um, supposed to become the uh, capital of uh, AI with true machine learning. And you've been uh, a visionary uh, since so many years. So what do you think about the possibility of developing an aesthetic of machine learning? Um, you know what? It was very hard for me to hear that. I, there's an echo with the mic, so could, could somebody just repeat it, like maybe closer? Okay. No, there's an echo. Okay. Um, in, Mon in Montreal, uh, Montreal is supposed to be the next capital of uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah. And uh, we have a big trend around the, uh, the machine learning. Machine learning, machine learning. Machine learning, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. And I would like to know, uh, as a visionary person, uh, 
what do you think about the emergence of um, the uh, aesthetic of machine machine learning? Okay, so um, that that's a great question. Uh, we're just looking at um, another lab that we're hoping to build, which is called the the Big Data Design Lab, and it it works with uh, technology. Uh, researchers and developers of machine learning and artificial intelligence, which, I mean, we're, we're already working in that space in both uh, the social body lab. Uh, there's another lab I didn't talk about that does a lot of work with gaming and wearable uh, technologies um, and inclusive design visual analytics lab. Uh, so it, it's, you know, AI has been at the core of um, data analytics from, from the beginning. Um, it's, it's not new. It gets renamed. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of gotten naturalized. Uh, so we're, but we're working on a lab that would very explicitly place um, the question of where human intelligence, human agency, human creativity, uh, human labor should be in relationship to machine learning. So, uh, you know, because we, we think we, uh, you know, researchers at OKU see this as a really fundamental, both ethical and design challenge. So we've kind of pushed um, ourselves to the IBMs of the world, um, uh, ESRI, others to say, put us at that interface. Let us ask those critical questions. Um, let's not make assumptions that everything should be, you know, automated. And let's look at places that, um, you know, shouldn't be, can't be, where there needs to be checks and balances. Uh, and, and I think the other piece that maybe I skipped over is, you know, we're constantly saying data is not neutral. Data is mediation. Data is produced. You need a kind of critical um, engagement with understanding the nature of data and each data set. So those two things together, I think, are very important. But I, I don't think we can step away from that that space and I think it's really important to engage and also look at questions of privacy and um, you know the sort of invasive nature of uh, biomedical data for example I'm probably not even answering what you asked me <laughs> sorry so we have to leave you now Sarah okay we so okay. I would like to thank you for your involvement in the new media art field on the Canadian base and inter international base. So.